Great. Thank you, everybody, and uh, thank you for your interest in, in this species and for joining us for the symposium today. Um, I want to present work that is a result of a NOAA Restore Science Program funded project on the trophic ecology of rice's whales in the Gulf of Mexico with our study partners uh, from Scripps Institution of Oceanography and Florida International University. And this study was really one of the, is, is a unique study in that it's the first multi-year focused study on rice's whales so that we start to get an understanding of their ecology and habitat uh, and how they're using the environments they're in. I also want to recognize that this work uh, is supported by literally everybody in our marine mammal branch at the Southeast Fishery Science Center. Uh, so our entire group of about 20 people, as well as people that we bring out with us on the cruises for the last decade or so, uh, contributed substantially to this project. Uh, and I also just want to uh, say in remembrance of a colleague of ours, Kevin Berry, who passed away this year, who contributed an awful lot of this to this study, including uh, working on the photo ID data. So with that, we've seen this map of, of where the animals are, and we've sort of started to answer a couple of really key questions so far. Uh, who are they? We've identified them as a separate species. Uh, where are they? With all the incredible work that Melissa has done and all of our historical science uh, sighting data, we're starting to understand that the animals occupy this narrow strip of the Gulf of Mexico. And so what we really want to start asking with this question is some of the hows and whys. Um, why are they in these habitat? What makes this habitat unique and something that can support the rice as whales? And how do they interact with the environment to support themselves? And so we started to dive down into this with focal studies inside the core habitat. So we have a couple of different data sources. Uh, first, we need to understand where the whales are over the broad scale in the Gulf of Mexico. And these were conducted largely with large scale vessel surveys conducted by the Southeast Fisheries Science Center since about 2003. Uh, these are surveys where we go out and we look on, on big NOAA ships and we survey visually. We also conduct passive acoustic surveys and a lot of environmental sampling as we go along. And you'll note that these track lines are drawn covering the entire Gulf of Mexico because these are multi-species surveys. Uh, these are designed to go out and measure the abundances of all 21 species that are occurring in the Gulf and are not generally focused on rice as whales. And because their habitat is so narrow, we actually end up having relatively little data inside that core, inside that habitat, especially in the central and western Gulf, where that narrow habitat band is very small. So through the NOAA Restore Science Program project, we were fortunate enough to have three surveys where we could go out and really focus on these habitats, uh, surveying along the 200-meter the isobath and throughout their known habitat in the, in the northeastern Gulf of Mexico in the summer of 2018, fall of 2018, and in the summer of 2019. And in addition to large vessel surveys doing visual and passive acoustic studies, we were able to do some prey sampling and also get out into the small boat and collect biopsy samples for some of the, to support some of the genetic analyses that Patty and their group have done, photo ID data so we can get up close and personal and start to understand the individual animals, and conduct some tagging studies to understand their behavior and how they're using the environment they're in. And having the opportunity to get out in the small boat, both on these surveys and in prior surveys, gives us the tools that we need to start developing a photo identification catalog based on the shapes of the dorsal fins of these animals, as well as body marks and scars. And you'll note up in the upper right-hand corner there, uh, if you recognize that fin from the stranded animal, the Everglades animal, or from the illustration, uh, that is witch hazel. That is the animal that we observed in November 2019. And again, if you recognize it, then congratulations, you can do photo identification of large whales. Uh, we also have a number of other animals. This uh, example is chip tip, which is an animal that has a linear scar where they uh, cut off the tip of the dorsal fin, and others that we're able to identify from dorsal fin marks. Um, but in addition, the animals all have uh, cookie cutter scars and other scars on their bodies, and we're able to use those, uh, those marks as well to identify animals through time. Uh, so this animal that we've called Splash, uh, these are uh, sightings from 2015 and 2018. And so this catalog currently spans about 15 years. There are 29 uniquely identifiable individuals based on dorsal fins and body scars, uh, though there are additional animals beyond that that we can't identify. And, and we've been able to integrate that with some of, the genetic sample, some of the genetic samples. So for some of the animals that we can identify, we also have genetic samples so we know their sex and we'll be able to match them further on down the line. 
So knowing something about where the whales are, we need to know a little bit more about the habitat. And we do this from a couple of sources. The first is from physical oceanog oceanographic models, and this is output from surface currents from the HICOM oceanographic model that looks at the physical oceanography of the Gulf of Mexico. And what you see in here is the dominant oceanographic feature of the Gulf, which is the loop current. This is a current of warm, fast-moving water that protrudes into the Gulf of Mexico, bringing with it low productivity, hot water, and then goes out through the Florida Straits and becomes the Gulf Stream. And throughout the year, as you can see, this, the loop current sheds off these large eddies that move through the Gulf of Mexico, penetrate up into the northern Gulf of Mexico, and what these effectively do is pull high productivity water from the continental shelf out into the deep water. And so where, these loop, where the loop current eddies act, they tend to pull, pull productivity out and also tend to concentrate it into places, in, into specific places. And so we see that this very dynamic environment is a location where high high productivity occurs in the deep water. As we zoom in into the Rice's Whale habitat in the northeastern Gulf, in the left panel you can see surface salinity and the influence of loop current eddies. And as you get into the spring and fresh water comes out of the Mississippi River, that loop current eddy drags that high productivity fresh water out into the deep ocean and into the Rice's Whale habitat. And on the right side, because things are three-dimensional in the ocean, we also see what's happening in the bottom waters, where cold water, cold nutrient-rich water from the, deep, from the deep part of the ocean is pushed up onto the continental shelf. And those cooler water temperatures occur really at that boundary along the 200-meter isobath, which is the place where we see the whales. So both the drawing of surface, surface, uh, surface uh, nutrient-rich water in the surface waters, as well as cooler nutrient-rich water in the deep waters, contribute to the complexity and the productivity of this habitat. The other data source that we use for this is, is satellite imagery, and on the left panel you see an animation of daily uh, chlorophyll from, from satellite imagery, which is a measure of the productivity in the water column, the amount of phytoplankton. The white pixels that pass over are the effects of clouds, because these are visual, these are visual uh, satellites, so we lose some data here and there. But you're seeing during the spring the drawing in with that fresh water of high productivity water in the surface that persists in the habitat throughout the spring, summer, and into the fall. And on the right panels, we see the association between Rice's whales, which are the black dots, and that water column productivity. So in summer and early and, and late spring, we see the animals further north up in the habitat associated with that plume. And in the fall of 2018, we see them moving a bit further south. So mirroring some of the patterns that we're observing in the passive acoustic data, where as this productivity en enters the habitat, the animals are moving in response to that. So taking that understanding of what the environmental features are like and what the dynamics are like in their habitat, we start to pull that together to understand the relationships between the broader scale distribution of Rice's whales and the broader scale understanding of the environment. And so on the left panel, we see uh, the distribution of four parameters, uh, bottom depth, surface chlorophyll, bottom temperature, and bottom salinity. And the open uh, distribution is where we surveyed, so basically what we sampled out in the whole environment. And the closed red, red uh, distribution show the distribution of rice's whales. So where these two are really different are showing selectivity of that habitat by rice's whales. And they're really located right along that 200 meter isobath in higher uh, productivity waters with water bottom temperatures averaging about 15 degrees Celsius and higher bottom salinities. But given that all of these parameters are correlated with one another, we need to do a little bit more advanced statistical modeling to look at the relationships between these parameters and which of those are the best explanatory parameters to explain the distribution of rice's whales. So we use a tool called generalized additive modeling that helps us understand what those species environment relationships look like. And once we understand them, we can use data from the physical oceanographic models as well as satellite data to project that out in space and map out the environment of the, of the rice's whales across the broader Gulf of Mexico. When we do that, we generate a rice's whale habitat and density map that shows the model density, the, the model density of rice's whales based on survey data collected since 2013. It identifies those core, uh, core features of bottom depth, bottom water temperature, and surface productivity as the key habitat features that predict the densities of rice's whales, and includes notably predicted density in the central and western Gulf where we've recently confirmed the presence of rice's whales from Melissa's work, as well as predicting the presence of, of suitable habitat for rice's whales 
in the southern Gulf in Mexico. And while there's very little sightings data to indicate whether or not they occur there at all, we're certainly looking forward to the passive acoustic studies that we're doing uh, in the southern Gulf to determine if they're actually using these suitable habitat areas. So we know something about the physical environment, but of course, Bryce's whales don't eat phytoplankton, and they don't worry about what temperature it is for the most part. But what we're really looking at are proxies for the distribution of their prey. And what are the physical features that concentrate high, high productivity of their prey items? And one of the ways we look at that is with echo sounder data. Uh, these are essentially scientific fish finders. As we cruise along on our surveys, we project sound down into the water. The amount of that sound that bounces back up to the ship is what uh, is, helps us determine what the backscatter is and how much, uh, how much material is in the water col column reflecting that sound. And different frequencies provide information about the different types of prey that are occurring. What we observe in their habitat is this very dense vertically migrating layer that, dis that goes down towards the bottom and ends up concentrating right above the bottom during daylight hours. And that layer rises in the water column towards the end of the, end of the day and disperses more widely in the water column. And we also observe these large near bottom patches and aggregations. When we see feeding, feeding rice's whales in the habitat, we generally see them in these areas where these aggregations occur. So these are near bottom aggregations of high acoustic backscatter, and you can see that they're very patchily distributed in space and can extend uh, several uh, tens of meters up off of the bottom. And these are the patches of prey that we think the whales are, are exploiting. We try to understand that by deploying satellite tele by deploying telemetry tags on the rice's whales. And an example, this is a, a tag called an Akusan tag that's attached by a suction cup to the back of the whale. It records information on 3D orientation, so how the whale is moving in the water column. It has a hydrophone on it, so it can record the sounds, both that the whale might be producing, the sounds in the environment, and it can also record the breaths of the whales when it's at the surface, and it also records the depth. And so with attachments that last on the order of 24 hours, or in one case, three days, uh, we can get information about day-night differences in behavior, and again, how they're moving through the habitat and utilizing those prey patches. So on the left panel, we see that day-night uh, dive behavior. So during daylight hours, these animals are basically diving to depths of 200 to 250 meters, more or less constantly, with dive times ranging between about eight, eight minutes up to about 15 or 20 minutes, and spending five to 10 minutes at the surface between each dive. So throughout the day, they're diving down near the bottom, and you can see that as they approach, sun, as they approach sunset, they're shoaling up and following that vertically migrating layer up as it disperses in the water column. At night, they're spending most of their time up at the surface, not feeding, and just below the surface, where unfortunately, at night, they're right below the surface, where they're particularly vulnerable to vessel strikes. So they spend a lot of their time near the surface all the time, but they definitely spend a lot of time at night. Taking advantage of that three-dimensional three accelerometer data, we can see an animation that Melissa actually created some time ago uh, about how the animal is moving through the water column. They identify a prey patch and then lunge up through that prey patch. And in this case, there's a second feeding bout where they circle around the animal. So what they're doing and how they're detecting prey down there is a mystery for us still. Keep in mind that it is dark. Um, so they're down feeding. They encounter these prey patches, circle around them, lunge up through them, and collect as much energy as they possibly can. Another data point that we can use to kind of understand how much energy they're able to gain against how much energy they're expending out in the water column is a new tool we're starting to develop on visual health assessment where we're looking at body condition, which is a pretty well-established tool in large whales to understand how their nutritional condition changes over time. And so you can see in this image uh, an animal that we described as scoop with that sunken axillary musculature uh, that we discussed also uh, with the witch hazel with the Everglades whale as well. And we're developing some standardized approaches both to collect this data and evaluate the extent of these kinds of things. So we do see animals that are in emaciated conditions fairly frequently. We also see animals in robust body condition. Um, but we really don't understand whether that's part of the natural cycle. I mean, again, keep in mind that there are very productive times of year, there are less productive times of year, and their, pa and their prey are distributed quite patchily in their environment or whether this is an indicator that they're, they're consistently in a nutritionally poor condition. So there's variability in animals across years and within seasons, and as we collect more data on this, we'll understand what that process looks like. 
The other thing we see in our animals is a lot of skin conditions. I think we noted that on the environmental, on the Everglades whale as well. And these are actually images of both of our tagged animals, Edna and Milky Way, who actually have these sort of small nodules over the extent of their skin. And there's a lot of variation in that, in the appearance of those types of lesions. And we really don't understand what those are caused by. But again, tracking individuals through time allows us to observe those changes in condition and correlate them with changes in body condition and the environmental features. So our conclusions, the first is that the complex physical oceanography of the Gulf and the interaction between the loop current and the continental shelf break supports that high productivity in Rice's whale habitat. That means pulling in water that comes by way of the Mississippi River, as well as water that is concentrated along that 200 meter isobath that is upwelled from the deep water in the Gulf. <clears throat> there is predicted suitable habitat in Mexican waters, but there is no data yet confirming their presence there. But again, these same physical features persist in those areas as well, and we suggest that there might be places where we might find more rice as whales. The prey is distributed in patches, and foraging requires a lot of energy expenditure. So they are constantly working throughout the day to dive down and gather enough energy in one lunge per dive. So it's really important that they're able to cue in on those prey patches, find them, and, exploit, and that they occur in places where, the, where they're able to exploit them. And finally, this ability to follow individuals through time really demonstrates a lot of variability in body condition and gives us the tools that we need to start improving our understanding of population demographics. And I think the big take home of the how and why is that rice's whales depend on a unique and limited habitat. And so it gives us a, a, a tool and a mechanism for us to develop, uh, to develop management actions around those places that are really important for, for providing sufficient energy for rice's whales to support themselves. So, thank you. Thanks so much, Lance. Uh, any questions for Lance up here? If you can't get to the mic, just we'll go for shouting. Anne again. Well, I, I think there's a couple of things. I mean, the, the fact that it has such a limited habitat and a, a really predictable area is not great in the sense that they don't occur in a lot of places. Um, but it is good in the sense that it lets you really design spatial, you know, you use this information for marine spatial planning. And we've actually done that so far. I mean, our, our habitat models and this, especially the identification of the, of the rice's whale well habitat has been provided in the planning processes for aquaculture and for wind farm planning and other things that are coming up so that you can try to deconflict those uses in the future. And so we've really been successful. Uh, a group uh, led by Nick Farmer at CIRO uh, has interacted with BOEM and some of the aquaculture planning groups uh, to really help prevent the overlap in the first place. I mean, it's almost like we could go back in time before the oil and gas industry started and say, hey, you know, please don't drill here. Um, where that gets to be a challenge, of course, is where you can't you know, separate those things in space. And I think that's where identifying sort of these really key habitat, uh, the, the, the trophic relationships can become quite important because we want to understand also, you know, we can't you know, impact whales, but we also don't want to do things that are going to impact their prey all that heavily as well. Um, so in the next talk, you'll sort of see what the, the take home message of what those big patches are. And that may again, cue us to steps that we can take to help make sure that the productivity of the habitat remains. Uh, climate change is of course an issue. Um, these animals can't move north. Um, so how, the, how that habitat will change over time through climate is another thing that of course we, we just will all have to deal with. So, thanks. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, Lance. Uh,